Daryl Black, and I am taking my 30 years of experience on the front lines of emergency response and emergency management. Well, uh, hello there, everybody. Welcome to the live cast where I am going to be talking about some leadership tactics and principles uh, that are specific to COVID-19, but uh, actually apply to any wide range of crises that we may uh, be confronted with as leaders. And I recognize that, man, it is in the crazy, crazy times with regard to the uh, COVID-19 situation for sure. And a lot of people are really reeling from it. And uh, kind of my take on it was, it was a slow burn. And then it just kind of, you know, hit really, really hard in terms of awareness and things like that. So I'm going to be talking about some some principles and tactics that you can take away right at the end of this uh, session and apply them to your leadership situation. And for me, um, it's all about my transformational leadership method where I talk about practical wisdom as a pillar. I talk about leading from the inside because if you can control what happens on the inside, then you can influence positively what happens on the outside. So that's the second pillar. And then the third pillar is leading in real time where to me, leadership is all about critical moments and critical moments that have to be handled in the moment uh, where you don't have time to go back and grab your book or you know your manual or, or check something out. And uh, frankly, this crisis that we're being confronted with involves re needing practical wisdom. It involves controlling the inside. It can, involves leading in real time, especially at those critical moments. And also in my experience, especially in my crisis leadership experience, it's not the straightaways that will get you. Uh, you know, you're uh, you're you're on your you're on your car, you're in your car and pedal to the metal. Everything's great as long as the the road is straight. But when that road turns, that's where we run into problems. And so, the advice and guidance I'm going to provide tonight will allow you to really lean into those corners and uh, and not careen off the the barriers and 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 all sorts of things like that. So. Uh, I guess, you know, probably a good place to start is I'm Daryl Black and um, I've spent 30 plus years in crisis leadership and I'm the creator of the transformational leadership method. And I wanted to share with you some of the experiences that I've had and, um, and the lessons that I've learned on large scale um, disasters and emergencies, things like hurricanes, Katrina and Hurricane Rita, um, Canada's two largest disasters hundreds of search and rescue missions, uh, almost a decade as a project manager for a large telecommunications company. And um, I remember it was 2016 and uh, we were a team I belonged to. Uh, we go into municipalities or counties, depending on where you're at. Uh, and we go in and we assist the local municipality post disaster, post emergency, or actually I shouldn't even say post, but during emergencies. And I remember, you know, driving in from, well, first we were flying in and, and this particular incident involved a mass uh, wildfire, uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest in the world. And uh, it, it's an event that you have probably seen pictures of, of, of individuals driving through flames and, and all of that stuff. So we go in and we respond to that. And I remember, you know, flying over the the city and you could see well, there's still obviously a ton of smoke, but a lot of, uh, you could just see very clear delineations of where the fire had in, uh, you know, impinged upon the, the city of which it was pretty substantial. And just being blown away by, it's like, wow. It, and it's a municipality that I'm very familiar with. And I remember we're flying over top and, and just, you know, you could hear a pin drop in a way. Um, we we're all looking out the window. So then we load into some buses and we're heading to what we call the emergency operations center, which is kind of like disaster headquarters. And, um, and for me, it's never about the incident itself. It's never about the crisis itself at first, which sounds kind of counterintuitive. But for me, one of the first things I need to do is I go through a little bit of a checklist mentally and psychologically and emotionally uh, right off the bat, even before I start worrying about the, um, the operational details about how many people have been evacuated, where is everybody, what's the damage, 
what does the forecast look like for weather? What is the fire going to be doing over the next 24, 48, 72 hours? Uh, where's the infrastructure at? Where's water treatment at? All of those types of things. So it's that process and those methods that I go through on a regular basis and, and continue to that um, I'm going to share with you uh, tonight. So in terms of right off the bat, I need to tell you one of the most important parts of, of leadership is providing safety. That's item number one. And as a leader, ultimately, it is that is our main job is is providing safety for the people that we support. Now, that also presupposes that you have your mind wrapped around the, the new reality that is leadership. And leadership is no longer about the leader at the top and the entire team supports that individual. It's actually the exact opposite now where the leader is propping up or supporting the team. And nowhere is that more important than during crisis or crises. And one of the most important tasks or jobs of the leader is to provide safety, both physical safety and psychological safety. So when we talk about um, COVID-19, for example, the physical safety are following guidelines and, and you know, hand sanitizer, washing your hands, enforcing as much as possible, social distance, all of those types of things, making sure that uh, cleaning protocols are in place, making sure that you're no longer shaking hands, all of those things. Um, it's your job as a leader to, if you're not creating those protocols, because chances are you're not, but your job is to provide the safety, provide the tools physically for the team and enforcing them. You know, and, and I get nobody wants to be that guy or that girl. I totally get it. But as a leader, that is your number one task and one number one tactic is to provide for the physical safety of your team. And further to that is providing psychological safety for your team. Now, that gets a little bit more interesting in that, you know, we tend not to think in, in those those ways. But as a leader... I'm telling you the, the amount of stress and the amount of uh, angst and, and anxiety and fear and um, uh, absolute you know disbelief, all of those emotions your team is feeling. And so you need to recognize that it's actually critical that you provide for their psychological safety as well. And the golden rule here, folks, is that your opinion about COVID, whether people are overreacting, not reacting enough, they're being perfect, or the politics, or any of that stuff. I'm here to tell you, your personal opinion does not matter. I'll say that again. Your personal opinion does not matter. So when you start talking about providing psychological safety, the last thing that your team needs is you pontificating whether we're overreacting or we're not reacting enough, or whatever that looks like right? Nobody needs to have their um, opinions squashed by their leader. Nobody needs to be told that they're overreacting. And you know, it's funny, I was just in, um, in a municipality earlier this week working with the post-secondary institution on COVID and uh, that uh, the meme comes up that, uh, you know, uh, when somebody says calm down, that has never worked, right? So never in the history of mankind has the phrase calm down ever actually calmed down. So think about that. You're providing psychological safety, which means you're, allow you're holding space for the team members to feel however they want. It's not up to you to decide how they feel about it. It's not up to you to agree or disagree. It just is. And we'll talk a little bit more about the emotional aspect of, of COVID and, and crises in your team a little bit later. But that's, that's principle number one and task tactic uh, number one provide physical safety, so all of those physical tools and, and things like that, and the psychological, which is actually even more important. So allow hold space for them, allow them to feel how they feel, allow them to um, have whatever opinions they have. Don't impose your values or your will on them because that will now further alienate and isolate them and they're already feeling pretty, pretty upset. And what's needed is actually people to come together and not separate. And as a leader, if you start um, you know, doing away with psychological safety, people will now start to separate and the anxiety will, will increase. 
Number two is, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, if I had a dime for every time I've said this, deal in facts and stop the rumors and speculation in their tracks. Just deal in the facts and stop the rumors and speculation in their tracks. Just so we're crystal clear, I get that people are going to social media for their information now. I totally understand that, right? There's phones, we all have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Instagram, we have, I don't know if anyone gets information from Snapchat, maybe, filter, doctor with a filter or something, I don't know, but hopefully that's not your main area. But regardless, the and a lot of the people that are posting things online are very well-meaning, right? So they're, they're talking about what's happening in other parts of the country. They're talking about you know, the latest study or the latest opinion on how we decontaminate or do we self-isolate? What does that look like? And I totally understand that people are well-meaning when they're sharing that information. And it can come from medical doctors. I totally get it. And it can come from emergency managers. It can come from uh, all sorts of places. And we think that we're educating everybody, and we are. But as a leader, it's really, 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 really important that you stop the rumors and end the speculation. So how do you actually do that? Well, lay it out in every single meeting that you have is you absolutely have to walk the walk and you stomp on the rumors. You stomp on the speculation. Deal with the moment. Deal with the facts. Now, as human beings, we are our default setting is actually to be negative, right? It's to think worst case scenario, which makes complete sense because from a survival perspective, when my cave men and women ancestors, when they emerged from the cave, um, I needed them to be pessimistic. I needed them to be scared poopless and think that everything was going to kill them and that survival was really, really important. And I, I appreciate that. Unfortunately, that default setting has stayed with us all this time. And so the same reaction that we have when we leave the cave and we don't know something, we're going to think worst case scenario back then, and we're going to do exactly the same now. So that's our default setting. We're, we're, it's part of our DNA. And so we have to recognize that people will, will just naturally see the worst case scenario in something. Also, when it comes time to, to just dealing in the facts and stopping rumors and, and the speculation in its tracks, walk the walk yourself, right? Don't engage in that. And I get that you're hanging out by the water cooler or, you know, somebody wanders into your office and says, hey, Daryl, like, what do you think about all this stuff? Hey, did you hear this? Did you hear that? Or I read about this. You know, and it's so easy for us to, to just kind of fall into that where, yeah, man, that's that's really bad. They've done this. They've, uh, they're talking about doing that. Or I've heard um, about this statistic. It's really easy for us to fall into that, into that trap. But as a leader, your job is to actually be the example, be the good example for what right looks like. And when you talk about stop the speculation, stop the rumors and deal in facts, that means you as a leader, you have to walk that walk and don't fall into the trap of speculation and rumor yourself. And as a leader, further to that, you have to establish what we call branded sources of information. Now, just to be crystal clear, I'm not saying that the MD that posted, you know, onto Facebook that's gone vi viral, no pun intended, um, I'm not saying that that's not legit or that they're incorrect. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that the nurse that's working in the hospital in the front lines is BSing. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is find your source of truth or sources of truth, your branded information, and May, let that be your anchor in terms of deciding what's a rumor, what's speculation, what's fact. So the main ones come to mind, uh, you know, World Health Organization, for example, in the case of COVID, your local uh, or pro provincial or state um, uh, health care uh, department, for example. Those are, those are what I would deem pretty credible branded sources of information. And so if you can go to those trusted sources, and you just decide that those are the ones that you will be using as guidance, stick with it because you will be tempted to fall into that trap. Like I said, you're human. You're a human being just like I am, just like everyone you're supporting. But don't do that. Just deal with the facts and realize that also too, information is neither good or bad, right? And I'll say that again. Information is really not either good or bad. It just is. And so the 
what makes it good or bad is the meaning that we attach to it. It's the interpretation that we attach to it. So as a leader, when a new piece of information comes in from a branded source, it's neither good or bad. It's not catastrophic or completely we're, we're out of the woods. It just is. And it requires some sort of action. So all information needs to be treated neutrally and do not be swayed you know, on this pendulum of emotion um, because people are looking to you to be that steadfast entity, that steadfast person, that go-to person, that when times are tough, People are looking for an anchor. People are looking for that beacon or that steadiness, that um, you know, that, that 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 stalwart kind of presence. They need that in times of crisis. And if you are now just you know, you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. That's that that that's terrible news. That's everyone. It's terrible news. That's not what's going to provide psychological safety for your folks. Also, too, it's going to stress you out like crazy. So get in the habit that information is neither good nor bad. It's neutral. And remember that, that the good or bad is actually the, the emotion or, or the interpretation that we assign to it or the meaning we assign to it. And a saying that I often use, and I use this you know, when I'm talking about this example where I walked into the emergency operations center. And it is, it's chaos. By any definition, it is absolutely a gong show. And um, so as I said, one of the first things I do is, um, you know, take stock of my own personal emotions. I take, um, you know, I take chalk stock of, of what I'm thinking and, and what I'm feeling and what I'm giving off really, really important. Like I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be stressed out. I don't want to be nervous. I don't want to be agitated. I want to recognize that information just is, it's neither good or bad. And uh, so something that one of my kind of standard opening spiels, if you will, is that I use the analogy of, of a ship and the ocean. And what I say, in, I'll paraphrase a little bit, is that the ship isn't actually, uh, the, the ocean is not what sinks the ship. Okay, I'll say that again. The ocean isn't what sinks the ship. What sinks the ship is actually water getting into it. So there's a breach in the hull or there, the water's starting to overflow or the uh, ship doesn't have a rudder or it's not well equipped, whatever that is. So for me, the team is all about, it's all about maintaining the integrity of the team, maintaining our communication amongst each other. And if it, you try not to make it an us versus them on the outside, but your job is to maintain the integrity of your team, make sure that your ship is intact, making sure that everyone on that ship is taken care of. And as a result, the, the better that is in place, doesn't matter what the ocean's doing. It can be, you know, a hurricane out there. But if you have a very solid ship, it's well equipped, you have a you're a good captain, you have a good crew, you're communicating, you're adjusting, all of those other things, it doesn't matter. The ocean could be absolutely chaotic on the outside, but your ship or your team is uh, is still intact. So remember that. Remember that that analogy. Keep that hull integrity in place. Now, this third one, so we've talked about providing safety, so that's physical safety, that's psychological safety. We've talked about dealing in the facts and stopping rumors in their tracks and, and speculation, no speculation. So you need to, to be reinforcing that, that behavior. You need to be walking the walk yourself, find branded sources of information, and making sure that your ship is still intact. Well, the third one is you need to plan. And you need to make the tough decision or tough decisions and act decisively. So there's a bunch of things within that. What I have seen during crises and COVID-19 is absolutely no exception. In fact, I've seen it maybe a little bit more because this has been a very slow evolving event and it's happening somewhere else, it's happening somewhere else, and then bam, it's happening here. So what I've really seen, more so than I've seen at other places, is analysis paralysis. And I totally understand that this is complex. Are we going to send people home? Will they be paid? All right, what about IT infrastructure? What about um, HR policies? What about, the, what about, what about, what about? All of these things. I totally understand that. These are tough decisions, but you have to make the decision. You are the leader make the decision. And if you are not the one making the decision, you know, the big decision, make whatever decisions you can within your sphere of influence. Act decisively. Don't die of analysis paralysis. 
So the rule that I adopt in, during crises is the 80-20 rule. Get it to 80% and then execute on it. Then you act decisively because you will never have ever 100% of the information. And if you have 100% of the information, I can promise you some of it's incorrect and it's going to change in 12 hours. So you have to get comfortable with making those tough decisions. You have to get comfortable with the eight, get, getting to 80% and realizing that you're going to win some and you're going to lose some. But act decisively. You can always fix it. But lean in and make a freaking decision. Because people are looking to you. They're looking to you to provide guidance and, and, and insight and stability and calm in this situation. If you're not going to give it to them, then where the heck are they going to be getting it from? Nowhere, right? So then to Facebook they go. Now, in terms of the plan, what does that look like? Well, you gotta figure out who stays, who goes, right? Who's essential, who isn't quite as essential? Who do you need to be more face-to-face -face present? Who can work remotely from home? What does that look like in the short term? And I'm here to tell you also, this is a marathon. Folks, this isn't like a wildfire where send people home right away and then in seven days bring them all back. This is this could be protracted. It will be over the course of weeks, months potentially. So think both short term, but also think long game, long game. So maybe that means you send half of your workforce, half of your team home, and you keep the other half here for two weeks or a week, whatever the number is, and then you switch. So you go with an A team and a B team. And it's not an easy decision. But you're going to have to say, all right, you are on the A team. You're A, 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 beat it. See you guys later. Head home, self-isolate, whatever that looks like, okay? But you have to be thinking longer term because this will be a protracted event. And the other thing with your plan is figure out your trigger points as well. So what does that look like? And the trigger point is something that if this happens, then we will do that. So if it's if this, then that. So maybe it's a really clear example is, let's say somebody is confirmed, right? It's a confirmed case of COVID-19. Well, that now is a trigger. So if this, so they've been positively, it's been confirmed, right? It's gone from possible to presumptive to confirmed. Well, then the trigger point is that, and then the action is everybody goes home or everyone gets tested or whatever that is, right? So that's a trigger point. So come up with a few of the triggers and have the conversations with your team around that. Have them involved if possible with those trigger points because involvement equals commitment, right? If they're part of that process, wow, they are far more likely to, to agree with the trigger point. They're far more committed to it because they've had input into it. Plus, it provides a locus of control for them, okay? And a locus of control is something that, um, it, it's a psychological desire that we all have, the feeling to, to exert um, force on our environment, the, to take control over our circumstances, have input into what happens to us. That's what we call locus of control. And people lose that during crises. So if you're involving them in the conversation, like trigger points, okay, look, if this happens, what are we going to do? Oh, you know what, Daryl, let's do this. I think we can do that, so on and so forth. Well, then that will go a long ways to providing that psychological safety we talked about as well, because people will have control, at least the sense of control. And also trigger points are really good because you decide on them ahead of time. So it's unemotional. So going back to the example that I've been referring to, the, the wildfire. Wildfire had left the city and was heading north. And the um, in our morning briefing, an individual was briefing us and saying, yeah, we expect the fire to make a run today. And so it came around and, and we determined pretty quickly that in the fire's way were 14,000 workers and camps and facilities. 14,000, pretty significant number. And so what we had to do is we had to determine a trigger point to figure out when they were going to evacuate. So when the fire gets to this point, and ideally a geographic location in our context, um, then we will do the trigger. We will pull the trigger and evacuate the 14,000 workers. So we determined that ahead of time. It was not emotional. We were able to think it through. We, were to th we got to the 80% and said, man, it's not perfect, but it's 80% because we're never going to get to be 100%. And then once we had that trigger point, we communicated it out. And that'll be what we'll talk about next. And then guess what? The fire reached 
that road, that geographic location, there was no debate about it. it the, the hard work, the planning, the discussion, the back and forth, the pros and cons, that had already been done. That had already been determined. So it was an easy uh, push of the button when it came down to it. So part of your plan are those trigger points as well. Now, recognize too, I see this all the time, guilty myself, don't get married to one plan, right? Just because it was your plan and it was a good plan on Friday, doesn't mean that that same plan is, is good on Monday. Even though you made it, and I get nobody wants to make a bad plan, and people are, you know, kind of are vested in that. I totally understand, but don't be married to it. People, things change. Things change. Circumstances change. Times change. Um, uh, policies change. Direction from government changes. The, the flow of, say, COVID-19 changes day to day. And so don't be married to a plan and don't be so uh, so married to it because it's yours and, and you have this perception that, well, hold on, I, uh, I don't want people to think that was a bad plan or, or that I don't know what I'm doing. No, people aren't stupid. They recognize that this is a fluid situation. Crisis by its very nature is chaotic and causes change. So the leaders that, that are really, really good, that lead and not just manage, they're the ones that are flexible with their plan and they're not married to it. And they recognize that it's not about them. It's not about their ego. It's about what best serves the mission, what best serves the team, right? It's putting that team first. What provides a physical safety? What provides a psychological safety? And I'm, I'm here to tell you, folks, we have, we have enough managers in this world. We really, really do. I love managers. We don't have enough leaders. And crisis is the ultimate textbook for leadership. And you have a real opportunity. It's a huge danger, but a real opportunity to show leadership and demonstrate what a leader looks like and crisis lead and not crisis manage. So provide safety, deal in the facts, plan and make a tough decision, the tough decision or decisions, act decisively with that. And this last one, I said three, but you know what? I'm on a roll here and I want to over deliver. <sighs> Communicate communicate, communicate. If I could say the word communicate more, I would. So what does that look like? Well, in the absence of information, the unknown represents fear or, or it causes fear in the team that we support. And again, if you go back to our cave person ancestors there, the unknown was, was fearful or fear invoking for a legit reason because it probably meant danger. So if I'm walking to the cave pool and I've got my cave family here and I've taken the cave day off from hunting, which is a bad idea. Um, and let's say we're walking and we hear something in the bushes over there and I've got my two cave kids here. I'm not gonna say, hey kids, go check that out. I don't know what it is, but maybe it's a pet. Maybe it's something you can play with. No, because that's a freaking dinosaur behind there or it's a saber toothed tiger or it's a snake or it's something. So we're def our default setting, again, is that we are, the, the unknown scares us. It invokes fear, it causes stress. So nowhere is that more prevalent than during crisis, right? Communication is so important because information, people are dying for it. People are dying for it. And so how can you do that tactically? Schedule a regular meeting, like have a standing meeting and, and there's actually two meanings to that. Have a standing meeting so people are standing. And what that does is that actually minimizes the length of the meeting. Try it. A little pro tip for you. But also a standing meeting. Maybe it's at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock every day. So people just know that at 2 o'clock each day there will be an update. So they don't have to seek the information. They don't have to ask around. They know they can start to get into their rhythm that 2 o'clock there will be a, a meeting. And, and it could just be an update. That's it. You don't need to get into a long diatribe necessarily or periodically engage in a conversation with, with the team to figure out what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what do they need, right? They want to be heard, that locus of control. So in terms of those meetings, have them regularly. And, and then one question that often comes up is, well, Daryl, what if there's no change? Like, what are you, you were going to meet every day, but maybe there aren't changes every day. Well, then guess what, folks? Tell the team, hey, folks, it's uh, one o'clock. Here's our meeting. Uh, just want to let you know, these are some of the outstanding issues. 
We don't have any real answers on that, but that's okay. We're still trying to seek it or we're still monitoring branded source of information or whatever, or this is what we're doing in the meantime. So just because you don't have an update doesn't mean that you don't meet. So people need to know that you are at least manning the ship, right? You're, you're, you're on the rudder, you're steering, you're doing something and that your, your eyes are forward, they're on the road looking for hazards. People need to know that. So communicate that. And there is an absolute tendency for you as a leader to be hectic, um, you know, stuck in this whirlwind, this Tasmanian devil, whatever. And, and I totally understand because it's busy. You got to plan. You got to do all these things I just talked about. So there's a tendency for you to be bolting in and out of your office or zipping by people. Totally natural, totally normal. But resist that. Resist that. Your job is to, is to support the team physically, but also psychologically. Check in with people regularly. And maybe that's not part of your regular day-to-day -day task, but too bad, so sad. We're in crisis, folks. Crisis, lead. Don't just manage. Be a leader. Don't be a manager. Don't be a supervisor. Lead. And part of that leadership is engaging in conversation with your folks, even if it's small talk that's okay. At least you're being available. At least you're hearing them and at least they are being heard. That's what people want. That's what the team wants. So don't be so wrapped up that, you know, I'm so busy. I'm too busy because I'm planning for COVID or whatever crisis. Take a couple deep breaths, sit down next to somebody and have a two minute, five minute conversation, whatever that looks like, but be present and engage. And then you'll really get a get your finger on the pulse of what, what's happening on the team as well. So there's an actual practical. So let's review again. Provide safety, and that's the physical and psychological safety. Deal in facts. So stop the rumors and speculations in its tracks. So that means walking the walk, enforcing that all of the time. Make a plan and make tough decisions and act decisively and recognize this. And maybe adopt an 80-20 rule where you're going to get to 80%. You're never going to get to 100% and that's okay. And don't be so married to your plan that you're not going to change it. Don't, don't take it as a personal affront or that you're not smart or that people are going to judge you if you're like, you know, yesterday this was our plan, but today based on current events, this is what we've, you know, what we, what we have decided. Now, the balance of that, of course, is you don't want to be changing the plan too much, but a lot of times I've seen people stick to a plan when it's way too late. That plan should have been garbaged a long time ago. Now, the last one here is actually a little bit more to do with you. And I'm calling it the, the ways of being for you, the leader. And it's part of my 1-100 Leadership Solution uh, book and, and method and all of those other things and involves ways of being. And, and the transformational leadership uh, method revolves a lot around controlling the inside and then positively influencing the outside. And during crisis, it's really easy for you to, um, you know, get emotional around people or, or around a certain event. And, and that, like I said, while normal or natural is something that you should try to avoid. So there, I'm going to give a very clear distinction here. You need to have emotion but don't be emotional, okay? So you need to have emotion, but don't be emotional. People don't want data from Star Trek. They don't want Spock. They don't want somebody that has absolutely no emotional intelligence or no self-awareness or is absolutely tone deaf to what's happening around them. And nobody wants a leader that is not sympathetic or non-empathetic. And so the four elements of the the 1 100 solution be empathetic and what that means as a leader is being empathetic means just holding space for them recognizing that the people on your team are feeling different things so it doesn't mean have sympathy for them because you don't even have to agree or disagree but be empathetic hold space for them that is so important and in fact in this day and age empathy should be a freaking superpower it should be taught in schools. It should be taught in leadership courses. It should be taught everywhere. So there's a complete lack of empathy and empathy is so, so important during crisis 
because people are going to be feeling different things and it's not up to you to decide whether that's legit or not. It's your job to hold space and let them, uh, you know, let them vent, let them feel however they want to feel and create that, that space for them. Further to that, the next part of that is be compassionate. I get that this can be an expensive ride. I get it. I'm a business owner myself and there are some real impacts. I was supposed to be going to California next week to teach a course for the US Forest Service. That has a financial impact to me. But you know what? Going back to my discussion around information, it's neither good nor it's bad. It just is. But ultimately, once you've been empathetic and you're holding space, you need to be compassionate for people. And you know what? Maybe it means bending a policy a little bit, right? I'm never going to advocate breaking a policy or anything like that, but maybe it's leaning into the gray area a little bit more because maybe you have, um, you know, single parents on your team. Maybe you have uh, folks on your team that have elderly parents that um, need to be taken care of because you don't want the vulnerable population to be going out into the masses, whatever that is. And again, you don't have to agree with it. Right? It's not about you agreeing, well, they should just be taking care of themselves or they're skip the dishes or order shit on Amazon. Why are you going? Uh, no, 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 no. That's what a manager does, not a leader. A leader is empathetic. A leader is compassionate. The other third one is being vulnerable. And what vulnerability does not mean is sitting in front of people being emotional. Okay? Because it kind of vulnerability gets a bad rap, in my opinion. Vulnerability can be as simple as, you know what, folks, I don't have all the answers. I don't. And so vulnerability, Brene Brown says it so well, where it's leaning into a situation or engaging in a situation that you don't have control or know the outcome. That's vulnerability, where you don't have control over it. And recognize that you're not perfect. You don't have all the information and you're making this up as you go along. I totally get it. And guess what? So does your team. And so if you are vulnerable and say, wow, you know, this is really challenging and we got so many things we have to worry about here and that I don't have a clear answer. Well, that's going to create a lot more connection with the team rather than not admitting that you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants. Because guess what? Your team will know. Your team knows whether you know what's going on or not. And if you are putting up a facade that, nope, no problem, nothing to see here. These aren't the droids you're looking for. These aren't the droids you're looking for. And then meanwhile, everyone's like, yeah, I think those are the droids we're looking for. The droids are right there. Why do you keep saying these aren't the ones, you know what I mean? Everyone gets it. So be vulnerable. So be empathetic, be compassionate, be vulnerable. And now the fourth one is be calm. Be calm. You do not want to contribute to the anxiety and the angst and the pressure and the stress, all of those other things. Leadership is about sacrifice. And what sacrifice sometimes means is you need to sacrifice your own opinion. You need to sacrifice how you're feeling about something, at least outwardly. And I can promise you, this is where really the pillar around controlling the inside and positively influencing what happens on the outside. Being calm has such a payoff, such an advantage from a leadership perspective where if I'm calm, it's contagious. It's contagious. I get there's a lot of contagious going around, but if I'm calm, naturally, energetically, biologically, neurologically, spiritually, all of those things, everybody around me will pick that up. Conversely, if I'm running around all stressed out all the time, guess what? They're picking that up as well. So be calm in this situation because people are looking for steadfastness. They're not looking for, you know, as I said, the data, the non-emotional person, but they're looking for somebody that is providing calmness, that's, that's smoothing the waters over rather than, than churning them up. So if you can think about it, going back to my ship analogy, think about it. How would it be if you're on a ship and your captain is like, whoa, wow, yeah, I, geez, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. This is terrible. This is terrible. There's no way we're going to get through this, folks. Not one chance. Well, what would you do? I know what I would do. I would be like, I'd dive off uh, into the water myself. Better off there than with this idiot at the helm, right? 
So think about that. Your job is to provide that calm. And if you're calm, you're providing for psychological safety. Also, if you're calm, guess what? You can deal with the facts. If you're calm, you can plan, you can make a decision, make a tough decision because you're, you're level-headed. And if you're calm, then you are a better communicator. Think about if you're, somebody is stressed out, their communication goes out the window. They can't decide on something. They're, they're, they're all over the map and nobody it feels safe around them. So think about that. So I'm going to review. The four, four things that you can do. Provide the safety, right? And that includes the physical safety and the psychological safety. Deal in the facts. Stop the rumors and speculation in their tracks. Boom. Walk the walk. Be the good example for that. You need to plan, make the tough decisions, and act decisively. 80-20 rule. 80-20 rule. You're never going to have 100%. And then communicate, communicate, communicate like crazy. Have regular meetings, email out regularly, phone calls, conference calls, uh, get hop on the video calls, whatever that looks like, communicate a lot. And even if you don't have updated information, then that's okay. But at least people will get into that rhythm and people will know that at one o'clock or two o'clock or three o'clock, information could, would, or should be coming forward. So they're allowed to focus on their jobs and, and what they need to do rather than looking at Facebook and so on and so forth. And making sure that you are empathetic. So be empathetic, be compassionate, be vulnerable, and be calm. And if you can do all of those things, of course there's a lot more that goes into it, but I can promise you over my 30 years plus, this is kind of like a playbook really of, of leadership and, and what crisis leadership looks like as opposed to crisis management. So. The transformational leadership method is all about practical wisdom. It's about controlling the inside and leading from the inside out. And then the last one is leading in real time, which means, as I said, it's making decisions now. It's interacting with people in the moment. And so hopefully you uh, found some value in this. I